welcome to Real Time Review. I'm your host, Jesse Nussman. With me, as always, is fellow Atlanta film critic, Jason Evans. And we Jason, got a treat. It's we got here. a treat. It's finally here. <laughs> we got a new Martin Scorsese movie, uh, his adaptation of Killers of the Flower Moon. The uh, I, I, Have you read the, the non I haven't. Book that I haven't, but some of our critic friends who've read it. Yeah, I read just, it as well. Yeah, just speak volumes great, about it. Great nonfiction book if anyone uh, is looking for anything to read. But um, this has been, I think, for me personally, I think the, the movie I've been most anticipating over the last couple of years since it was announced, um, Scorsese reteaming with Leo and De Niro to adapt, as, as we said, this kind of like beloved nonfiction book about a really shocking piece of American history that I feel like yeah. few people know about, um, which is the uh, murders that happened in Oklahoma among the Osage uh, Native American tribe in kind of the 1920s kind of became one of the very first big FBI cases. Well, it was actually, and they, they don't lean into this in the movie, but mm -hmm. just so people understand, the FBI was almost formed as a response to this, that, mm -hmm. that the, uh, the federal government realized they needed a mechanism to investigate these scores of murders mm -hmm. and that local authorities weren't doing anything about it. And that's what, that's how the FBI got formed. And they actually mentioned J. Edgar Hoover's name right. at one brief moment one in, the, brief in moment. the film. Yeah. Yeah. So the book is, 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 and not to get too much into like comparing and contrasting that with the movie, because that's not really an interesting conversation, but the book uh, takes this sort of, the, the way the book sort of gets into this story is through the FBI, essentially, is so you're reading it almost like it's sort of a detective novel. A case novel, almost, right. a case file. <laughs> and it's interesting I bring that up because that was kind of the original way this movie was sort of pitched when it first happened or when it first was announced and that Leo was going to be playing sort of the main FBI character. But I think what Scorsese and Eric Roth, who co-wrote the movie, and everyone involved kind of did was... In some way, I think a much more interesting way into this story, which is to sort of turn it inside out instead of like the FBI as sort of um, our sort of first person experience through this world. Um, it's really about the people in this community. It's yeah, they're, like, they're more interested in the relationships than mm -hmm. the crime to some extent and unraveling the crime. And in fact, Martin Scorsese has openly said this is not a whodunit. There's right. never any question about who's committing these crimes. It's more about why they're committing them and more significantly, what it does to the people who are both committing the crimes and affected by them. Yeah, so obviously, I mean, the, kind of the main heart and center of the movie is this interracial couple, Leonardo DiCaprio playing a, a the white husband, uh, Lily Gladstone, who's an incredible actress. If there's any uh, <laughs> people who Brand saw- Brand new, by the way. So if, or if anyone, um, you know, if you're a Kelly Reichardt fan, you saw the film Certain Women from a few years back. She was great in that movie. Um, but I think we'll be kind of like a discovery for a lot of audiences who right. see this. Um, and essentially in this, this, this town, in this community, the Osage have been able to inherit all of this wealth because there is oil kind of underneath their land. And a lot of the movie deals with the tensions between them and sort of their white neighbors oh, and the various ways that look this is history there's not too, I won't spoil too many details about the movie other than to say like what ends, ended up coming out of this murder conspiracy is sort of like a way in which a lot of the sort of like white people surrounding uh, the Osage community sort of killed them off and sort of uh, broke their trust and tried to get this wealth and money from them um, and it becomes sort of this really I thought powerful kind of using this sort of marriage as this sort of powerful allegory for kind of this sort of like fractured relationship between Native Americans and kind of these white settlers in this area and becomes I think this really kind of powerful reckoning with kind of a dark piece of American history that most people probably aren't even aware of. Yeah and one thing I want to make clear about me as a film critic as a reviewer and and what I want the audience to get out of what I have to say that's that I appreciate movies as art, mm -hmm. but when I'm talking to people about them, I'm thinking of them as entertainment. Mm -hmm. And you're probably going to hate this, but I think this film struggled a little bit as a piece of entertainment. It is three and a half hours long. Mm -hmm. I want to repeat that. It's three and a half hours long. And to be clear, mm -hmm. I loved Oppenheimer, which was also three plus hours long. Mm -hmm. This film to me didn't, didn't reach that level of holding my interest the whole time. When every second that Robert De Niro is on screen, mm -hmm. I thought he's just crackling. I'm captivated by him. And his character literally had me sitting up out of my chair mm -hmm. every moment he was on screen. But he's not on screen 
the whole film. And there are long stretches where he's not on, where I thought the movie lagged a little bit. And I know I disagree with you about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you mentioning De Niro, I should mention that De Niro's character is kind of the, you know... The ringleader, so to speak? So to speak, of this whole conspiracy and is the uncle to the DiCaprio character. To me, I, I have to say, all three and a half hours, I was totally, like, just glued to the screen. And, like, it's almost funny you know, in this time where we're thinking about kind of like, what do we want out of the theatrical experience? Like, I I like uh, seeing a movie that this this feels like... It has to be a theatrical experience. This is going to stream on Apple. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine people sitting at home watching this film for three and a half hours, not being able to really immerse themselves in the the audio and especially the visual. It's a gorgeous film. Yes. I, I don't know, why do you put these films out on streaming when they are built? This was a movie built for theaters. Yes, I mean, thankfully it is getting a bit of a theatrical rollout this weekend, um, and I would highly encourage people to see it in a big... Just for, in those three and a half hours, I think, to to give yourself over to Scorsese and give yourself over to this world and kind of let it all wash over you. Um, th- there's something about this movie that I find, for as much as it's dealing with this very dark, murky part of American history. There's something I found so moving about this movie and so moving about I don't disagree. his openness in, and his curiosity with the Osage people. This, there's, there's a version of this movie that could have so easily been kind of like, look, Martin Scorsese has made so many wonderful American crime epics that I'm sure you and I will talk about some of our favorites here in a bit. And you can see a version of this movie that you know, he can kind of do in his sleep and do like a very entertaining version of it. Sure. Do like Old West Goodfellas. And he kind of does that, but I think where his heart really lies in this movie is with the Osage people and his willingness to just sort of spend so much time enveloping you in their culture, in their world, in their customs is something I found so moving. And I think the way the movie kind of progresses, I think becomes not just a reckoning with American history, but I think it is one of our great American artists kind of wrestling with who who am I to sort of, as an outsider, to tell these people's story? And what responsibility do I have to sort of like convey their beliefs, their customs, their hopes, their dreams? Um, and you can see him kind of wrestling with that, I think, in a bit of the movie, in the way that it's it's cut, in the way that you know, it lacks some of the kind of aggressive flash that some of Scorsese's other movies do. And even, I think, without getting into spoilers about the ending, which I think would require a lot of context for people, because <laughs> um, it, it, it does have a very unusual ending, I would say. To me, the ending even becomes this kind of moment of him looking inward and sort of saying, like, I totally am, am I even the right person to be able to tell this story? And, like, does it ultimately just belong to these people for and is doing a sort of like true crime epic really a disservice to them and their whole culture. That's just something I found so like emotionally overwhelming for to see an artist at his age who has had so much success just willing to be kind of that open and kind of vulnerable with just sort of like his relationship to the material is is something that like I, I can't say enough just like profoundly moved me by the end of the movie. Jesse, I agree with every single thing you said but I come back to, is it entertaining? Mm -hmm. Are large scale audiences going to come out of this film and go, wow, I I loved what I saw. I was captivated the whole time. I think that a lot of what you've said gets in the way of that a little bit. And again, not to say it's not worthwhile, not Mm -hmm. to say this isn't Scorsese emoting about his inadequacies Mm -hmm. and and probably emoting about the fact that this story hasn't been told accurately in the past. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's all there and it's, Great that it's there. It's art, mm-hmm. and it's probably going to win awards. I just don't know that it's entertaining. And and my bottom line is, I love the fact that these streamers, that Netflix, Amazon, in this case Apple, are giving money to these big name directors, mm-hmm. to these great artists, and letting them do their thing. That's a wonderful thing for all of us in the movie in the movie watching business, so mm-hmm. to speak. But at the same time, I think they are not making those artists take a second look at their art. I think this film needed someone to come in and say to to Martin Scorsese, three and a half probably isn't right. Can we get this to three? Can we get this to 245? Tighten the story a little bit, maybe get some of those storylines to work together a little bit more and not be as disparate. 
because then you will attract more people to the film. More people will see it. It will last longer. Mm -hmm. How often do people talk about The Irishman today? came out just a couple of years ago. Compared I to quote The Irishman almost every single week, but I'm also <laughs> a weird psycho that's been watching Martin Scorsese movies since I was like 14. But I mean, that's, that's another one that's yes. like three and a half <laughs> hours long on Netflix. I don't think it's really part of the film or societal conversation today. And yet, Goodfellas mm -hmm. and uh, plenty of other films that Scorsese have made that had a little more restraint in them mm -hmm. are still incredibly relevant. Well, I, I guess I would just wrap up my thoughts on sort of the running time with just being like, the, the encouragement to audiences to like, to experience it as an experience, as this sort of like overwhelming thing that you sort of give yourself to. And, and I think that is a sort of profound thing in our day and age where we have so many kind of uh, screens buying for our time and kind of, yeah. like I said, I cannot imagine like so many probably people probably watch The Irishman, like watching this at home and you know, you're distracted by your phone and you, you don't have that sort of like, total like immersion, give, immersion yeah. and sort of giving up your your evening and your afternoon to like I'm, I'm going to like sit and be part of this and, and kind of let it sneak up on you in, in interesting ways I mean I, I think we should definitely talk about you know the performances I agree with you De Niro incredible do, playing a absolutely like horrendous villainous character but with like a twinkle in his eye and a little kick in his step and is yeah. like the most kind of warm grandfatherly figure um I think based you're off You're taken of, in by him. I mean, you're definitely, yes. again, they don't try to hide any of it. From the very start, I think his, his plan and his plot, so to speak, is very transparent. Right. But you still, you like him and you like being around him. Right. He's Lily, a people person. Lily Gladstone, <laughs> I think, is doing so much with just her eyes and, and can just sort of convey so much just through like the slightest little glance or sort of like movement of her cheek. I think we're going to disagree a little bit on DiCaprio. I think this is one of Leo's best performances. Wow, really? Um, I thought, but I have to say, I think Leo needs to just play idiots from now on. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like Leo's character, I, I think this is the most complicated part he's ever dealt with, like, and also a character that does some pretty horrendous villainous things, but I think still maintains an empathy to a point where, like, when you get to the end of the movie, I was just sort of feeling like, I don't, I don't know how to feel about this character, and maybe that's ultimately, like, one of the messages of the movie is we're going to sort of explore this whole conflict in all of its sort of complicated thorny contradictions and that character sort of being at the center of it being a character that does horrendous things throughout the entire movie but yet also there's a, a tender side that you can well there's a lot of, of love with. there's a yeah. lot of love in his relationship with lily gladstone and and i think one of the failings of the film is that i don't think the film knows i don't think scorsese knows i don't think dicaprio knows what to make of this character there are moments where he does things that are incredibly empathetic. To, to the very end, I believe that he loved his wife, mm -hmm. even as he was doing horrible, terrible things to her and people around her. Uh, and, and I would have liked it if the movie would have grappled with that a little more than it did. It just kind of happens. Uh, I, I'm not saying Leo does a bad job. He's one of our finest. Right. He's one of our finest actors. There's no question about that. And this is an incredibly complicated role. I, you, you mentioned him being, you know, playing the idiot. Mm -hmm. He's definitely the idiot early on. He evolves a bit. And, and again, one of my problems with the movie is that I didn't see why he evolved and changed into slightly smarter, slightly more aware toward the end of the film. I, I, again, that's something that was missing. Last, last thing I would have on this film, mm -hmm. I think you're right. If people stick with it, mm -hmm. it does really pick up, like the final hour, Final hour is, is like so. It's I, propulsive. Right. Uh, and once the FBI comes in and starts investigating, the film really takes off. But that's two and a half hours into the movie. <laughs> you literally have to sit through an entire movie to get to the part of the movie that, to me, again, had me sitting up the out of my chair. The more conventional sort of crime movie aspect of the movie. And I, I, hate, I hate that I'm talking conventional. <laughs> I, I, I wish. I wish that art and enjoyment mm -hmm. could go more hand in hand. And I want to be clear. It's not a bad, not even, it's not even close to a bad film. Uh -huh. It's an excellent film. I just think it's a tough film. That's, that's fair. I will, I will concede there of it, it. It is a challenging movie in very many ways. We've made peace. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about Scorsese in, in general, who, I mean, to avoid this just becoming another boring conversation of two white guys talking about how much they love <laughs> Martin Scorsese over again, but what does Martin Scorsese mean to you? I mean, he's one of the most, like, totemic figures in American cinema, but yeah. just, like, 
you personally, like what does Martin Scorsese mean to you in your journey through movies? I, I mean, Martin Scorsese is, he's someone who amazingly over the course of the decades hasn't really declined. No. Uh, which is, uh, there's just not a lot of other directors I think who are like that. And so many of his films have created such iconic characters. I think he is an actor's director, perhaps as much as anyone out there. I mean, uh, he does incredible stuff with the camera and moving it around. Some of his films in include incredible stories, but his ability to get the, uh, you know, if you ask people, you know, what's the greatest performance of Ray Liotta's career? It's Goodfellas. Uh, there are a number of actors like that where you go, what's the best performance of their career? And you often come back to a Scorsese film. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, like, you bring up, like, how the longevity he's had. You can't think of too many people. He's been at the center of movie culture for 50 years at this point. Yeah. And even you look at some of his contemporaries from the 1970s, Coppola, De Palma, even, I mean, like, Spielberg's maybe the only one who can still kind of get the kind of big budget, but even then, like... Spielberg's been a little more up and down, even I think. I don't, I don't and get he does, the feeling... Spielberg does so much. Yeah. Uh, Spielberg's trying to crank out crank out's the wrong word, a, a film every year or two. Scorsese I, takes more time on his pictures. And, and I still get the feeling like I could walk into a Martin Scorsese picture and see his next masterpiece, whereas I maybe don't feel that way with like a Steven Spielberg picture of maybe like yeah, I agree. enjoy Spielberg's movies, but maybe don't feel like he's still operating at his peak level. Scorsese's still operating, and I don't know if you read the, there's that great GQ interview with him recently, and there, there's just something so moving to him talking about how open he is about just sort of like still being a student of cinema and wanting to advance as an artist and kind of like what how can I reach the next level what is the what is the next story I can do that's different than what I've done before what is the next technique I can do that's different than what I've done before he could so easily just sort of phone it in for like the rest yeah. of his life but this is a man who doesn't want to phone it in at all and this is a man who also has done so much for just sort of film preservation and sort of ensuring that kind of like, you know, older movies, movies from other countries sort of find their audiences and people can sort of get a greater experience for the wider diaphora of cinema. Um, let's let's talk about some of our favorites, obviously. I mean, oh, the, yeah. the last thing I want to mention, you were talking about he's a great actor's director. I definitely agree. While also he is someone who I've maybe learned more about the the sort of technicalities of filmmaking from him than any other filmmaker. How, as you said, the movement of the camera, the cutting of a scene, the introduction of music, the framing within a scene, how all of that conveys sort of an emotional response to you as an artist. Um, you know, I think a movie that both of us have on kind of like a top five list that, that, that we're sharing is Goodfellas. That is the movie I've probably rewatched yeah. more than any other movie. It is a movie that every time I see it, I can pick up on some new little detail, whether it's, uh, as you said, a way he moves the camera, a shot choice, a music cue that I, I enlightens something new in me, um, as well as it's just like, you know, seeing those mobsters like in kitchen, in the prison kitchen, like making the pasta sauce, like that's my comfort Cutting food. the garlic so thin exactly, that it melts in the exactly. pan. Oh my God, <laughs> yeah, the, the detail there. I, I think if you, if you, like if you look at my top mm -hmm. five lists, yeah. That I hope we're putting on the screen yes, right now. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, my list of the of my five favorite Scorsese films. I, I go back to the entertainment thing, but each of these films are are movies where the characters just jump off the screen, and his ability to immerse you in a scene and in the emotions of the characters. It, it, it you know, there's a reason he's considered arguably almost, you know, our it, greatest living American. I was going to say filmmaker. greatest living filmmaker. Right. I'm trying to think. You know, uh, Christopher Nolan, Quentin Tarantino, Spielberg. I guess there are a couple others who'd who'd be in the conversation. We don't get, have to get into that debate, no. but <laughs> there's no question that Martin Scorsese is in there. And I, I, uh, there are so many of his films that the moment I watch them, uh, like if they're on cable, uh, like on my list, like The Color of Money. Yeah. The Color of Money comes on, and like people, I think when you think of Scorsese, everyone's like, oh yeah, Goodfellas and Casino and The, the Departed. The Departed, know, all these crime epics. My number one, yes. the crime epics, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and then like if you looked at my list, number four is The Color of Money because I think it's it's arguably Tom Cruise's best performance. Mm -hmm. Paul Newman, an incredible actor, when won one Oscar in his career. It was for The Color of Money. The the fact that he made a sequel to The Hustler where you don't have to have seen The Hustler or know anything right. about it to appreciate that film. 
He's just, he's an incredible director. I've, I've also been a big fan of his comedies. I mean, two of the ones that I have on my list, The King of Comedy, with uh, which has like maybe my favorite De Niro performance. It's way and, up there, yeah. And is a movie that you go back and look at the reviews for it and people are like, this is a little mean. Like, what's what's what people did not like it when it came out, and now I think is so prescient about our like celebrity culture and sort of this oh, yeah. get rich, get famous idea of America. Um, I know you and I disagree a little bit about. I'm a big Wolf of Wall Street fan. I think that is like an in incredible like Fellini esque satire on just American greed and like American ambition and and sort of capitalist excess. Look, there are parts of the Wolf of, Wolf of Wall Street that I adore. There mm -hmm. are individual segments, and, and by segments, I mean long, right. 10 plus minute long segments. I just think the whole thing's a little tedious at times, mm -hmm. but. but. But even like in talking about like, you know, the other kinds of movies he does, I mean, um, you and I were talking a little bit like before the movie last night, like, you know, there's The Age of Innocence, which is a terrific like period romance movie. He's I done, mean, the breadth, yeah. yeah like the he, fact that he can make those films, a film like this, yeah. a film like uh, all, the all the crime dramas, it's incredible. You know, he could do The Last Waltz, which is like one of the great concert movies ever made. Yeah, perhaps the greatest. Um, two others that I feel like we need to talk about, um, unless there's any that you can think of. I'm trying to run through our top five list and a little out of order. <laughs> um, I mean, Taxi Driver and Raging and Bull. And Raging Bull. Ob obviously two seismic movies. I mean, yeah. I, Taxi Driver, I just remember like being... 16 when I saw it and just it like frying my brain of like I've never this is a movie that is simultaneously like so disturbing and upsetting but yet I think also that kind of like with Leo's character in Killers of the Flower Moon there is an empathy to the Travis Bickle character that I think makes kind of the horror of it all the more upsetting because you're sort of like I I, I feel for this man even though he is you know a monstrous person that like could snap at any moment and that's kind of also the the trick with Raging Bull too, and and you know that's a movie I rewatched a couple months ago, and you know opens with um, that kind of one line for the the like once I was blind but now I see, and is you know that is a movie that is we're going to tell you a story about a monstrous human being, but like dare you to like do we have empathy with him? And I, th I think that is a running theme throughout so many of Scorsese's movies that I think is deeply connected to his sort of Catholic faith and you know you can really see come through in stuff like Last Temptation of Christ or Silence of like he he's constantly he likes of, bad guys right I mean he really likes there's bad guys. this sort of great Catholic guilt of like you know what does it mean to be redeemed and like can we really you know truly be like re quote redeemed in the eyes of God and and sort of is as I think kind of a theme in a lot of his movies and I think why his sort of crime movies and his movies about kind of like the the underbelly of society and the underbelly of kind of our human id are so powerful and so resonant is, you know, we see something in them and then it's like, you know, can, can that part of ourselves, can that part of our society ever truly be redeemed? Well, I, I, look, we're here waxing poetic about the guy <laughs> because he is an incredible director. And if you think about going back to Taxi Driver, Think about how young Jodie Foster is in that yes. film. Think about how young Robert De Niro is in that film compared to where yeah. he is today. And yet, think about the are you talking to me mm -hmm. scene in the mirror and, and how that scene is still resonant today. It's still something that every film school student is going to watch. Everyone who appreciates movies is aware of it. And we are 50 plus years since that happened and Martin Scorsese is still making important, important movies, award caliber movies that we're spending a half hour plus talking about. And, and I'm sure we could spend probably three more hours yeah, talking we need about a, it. We, need but yes, we should <laughs> give the audience a break. Uh, Jason, thank you as always for, for sticking with us and we'll, uh, we'll have you back next time for another review. Sounds good.